When we talk about machines, we're first going to talk about safety. And I have the scroll saw. And it's got to be the safest tool, power tool in this whole place. Um, so it's really hard to come up with some safety things. So uh, the only thing I could think of is that little thing goes up at about uh, 1,000 RPMs. Put your finger against it, it's going to hurt. Okay, so <laughs> don't, don't touch it. Watch where you're going. So um, the other thing is it generates dust. Um, not a lot, but it's very fine. And if you've got any wood toxicities at all, wear a face mask. Okay, I am kind of allergic to western red cedar. And if I do very much, I put a mask on. But other than that, there's not much. They're all done by high school teachers telling the students what to do. And truthfully, if I took that course, I'd probably fail. Because the first guy said, every time you change the blade or refeed it, unplug it. Well, nobody's going to do that. You know, I've never done that in my life. Um, the on-off switch is way back there. The blade's up here. It's not a big deal to do that. Okay, so... I never do that. But it got me thinking that if you had a bad scroll saw, that that on-off button was not, um, was delicate or it was in a place, <coughs> use, a, use a foot pedal. The electricity is all on the foot pedal. You take your foot off, there's no electricity. It doesn't matter if you turn it on or off. It works, okay? I'm going to talk about a foot pedal in a second, too. Can I make another comment about that? <laughs> when, when Don says take your foot off it, take your foot off it. Don't, don't lift it up. Because I've seen people that have just lifted it up a little bit and they're changing the blade. They'll push the foot back down. down and so take your foot off it. Do that too. No. <laughs> Don told me he did yeah, that. There are two different kinds of foot pedals. There's tap on and tap off. Okay. For your scroll saw, you should use the dead man variety. Okay, which means your foot's got to be on it for it to go, the power to be at it. So as Wayne says, if you just kind of leave your foot there, you got a chance of going on it too. So that's the the next guy that I saw. Teacher says, take that little guard that's there and always adjust it. That's on the. I, I don't think any of our scroll saws have them here. They're sitting in the back someplace. Um, I took mine off the day I got my scroll saw. But you can have situations where that wood will jam and go up and down, etc. And there's a number of things. One is the blade. The, the uh, points go downwards so that it pulls the wood down. I use what's called a UR blade, which is two down, one up, so it's hard to touch it, but it's got a little kink on the top. So for me, that's the only way I know because it's got a kink on the top. Um, the other thing is, is that you've got to use the right um, techniques in holding your wood down. We have the cubs here and they're all afraid and they're back here pushing it. They don't want to get their hands near the blade. You can watch it. You can get it. You've got to hold the wood down. And it's very important when you're doing like a compound thing where you put your knife, your blade right through and you've got an inch and a half it will catch in a hurry and go ch -ch -ch -ch. That's why I use a foot pedal too. I have the other kind, which is starting, a dead man's one. Because that way you can hold the wood down, press it to go. It doesn't go ch -ch -ch. And then because once it's there, it's going ch -ch -ch -ch, and you've got to reach for it. Now you only got one hand on it. So the wood's flopping around, etc. So I like to use a foot pedal. I know there's a whole bunch of people here who says, oh, I wouldn't use one of those. But it's a real safety thing, and boy, I use it. I've always used it because it came with my saw. So um, they're not expensive. They're thirty-three dollars at Busy B, fourteen dollars at Harbor Freight, and you all refer to Harbor Freight a couple times tonight because uh, I don't know if Prince's Auto does it, but it's cheap. 
Other last safety thing I'm going to say is when I do these little ornaments, you get that up close? There's that little bird there. That little bird is a little, little small piece of wood that's not big enough to, to hold on to. So you can buy. <laughs> That's compound. There's the little bird. The piece of wood you cut it from, okay, is that piece right there, which is really quite small um, to hold on to. You can't do it on it. So this is the mechanism I use. Two little cheap clamps, a piece of scrap, and I glue on sandpaper. Holds it nice and tight. And you go in there and do your cut, no problem. Hands away, you got full control. It's really nice to, to do it. Um, nothing. There are plans online at Steve Goods um, to make one with a spring and a, uh, I don't know, if there's a wing nut on it or something. This I always have available. It's quite cheap. And I actually have a bigger one when I do another compound stuff. So that's all I can say about safety, you know. Um, it's not a, a dangerous machine. So, can we start our... Yep. <coughs> oh. Okay. Um, Why don't I see it? either from there or from the beginning, one or the other. technique. Um, anybody that's new, there are two sets of, of scroll saw lessons. One is by uh, Sheila Landry, which is a really famous uh, Canadian pattern maker. Um, and she did a whole series on lumberjocks. Um, I don't know if anybody's members of lumberjocks, but it's good to go through. Even if you're a seasoned scroller, it tells you a lot of techniques that you kind of didn't think about. And the other one is my friend Steve Good who um, has a whole section about doing circles, doing tight turns, doing squares, doing straight lines, all of those little things that you might want help on. So that's just two things to get technique of making your scroll sawing better. So next one. Now, when I come to this club, I, get, I make up a mental bucket list of all of the things I see at show and tell and um, people show of, that they're doing and I put that on my bucket list if I'm going to do that. I'm a little bit of an ADD. Jack, you know, you know uh, master of many, you know, jack of all trades, master of none, that's me. So, next one. One of the things that I 
picked up here is Intarsia. Um, and then for those who don't know, the Intarsia has been around uh, since the 15th century. It's a mosaic of fitting woods together uh, to make a picture. And really, in today's world, it's creating art in wood using the colors and the grain of the wood. Now, a true Intarsia artist won't paint, won't do anything. I stain, you know, people do stains, people do everything, so we're gone. Sure okay. So can you, next. How I got interested. It's all through the show and tell that was here. I think these are Charlie's here. Or Leroy's. Or, or next one. These are definitely Leroy's, okay. Um, and the next one. Okay, they, they were Leroy's. They really got, um, for you that don't know, Leroy used to be here, sat in the back corner, hours and hours making these things, okay? He used a Dremel, the two sanders back there, and that's all he used. I mean, it was really um, painstakingly, but he did a beautiful job, and him and I used to always chat about it, that I was going to get doing it, but it got put off for a number of years. Next one. What really got me interested, about three years ago on a road trip down the Blue Midridge um, Parkway to Dollywood going on to Nashville, I stopped at Seymour, Tennessee, which is Judy Gale Roberts' uh, studio. It is absolutely magnificent. If you never did Antarsia, just to see what she's done. This is the main studio, and you can see all of that Sealing the wall with artwork um, of hers. Next one. And this, most of its patterns that are for sale, this is some of the stuff that's not for sale. I forget, this is called African Safari. Um, there's over 900 pieces of wood in that. There's no stain, no anything used. And when you see it, I don't know if you can see up here, there's little critters in here. Mice and snakes and, I mean, it's... Phenomenal. Next one. So when I was there, I was lucky that Judy was there and gave me the 50 cent tour. It is a, a workshop to, for a scroll sawyer. There's got to be 10 workstations because they do do lessons. Everyone's got a, uh, an Excalibur uh, scroll saw. It's got a sanding station. It's got a layout station. It's got gluing. It's got lighting. It's phenomenal. So next one. So she gave me the tour, and this is a class that's going on. She sent me this picture just recently, but that's her and that's Stacy. And the difference with Judy Gale Roberts over many of the other pattern makers is every pattern that Judy Gale makes has been made, cut, and is on display. It's that. And I don't know if you can see this, but when I was there, she was working on this horse, and she was making four copies at the same time. She's in different woods different techniques, and then we'll pick the best. And she showed me it all, so it was quite the trip. So, okay, I got that far. And this is the story of my journey of how I started doing Intarsia. I gotta you know, say that I'm a beginner. Um, in Judy Gill Roberts, to take her in reading class, you have to make about 14 different, fairly complex, a little more complex than I'm making. But I'm going to tell you how I got there, where I'm at, and what I'm doing right now. So, next one, first one. First thing is. So she won't let you in your class unless you. That's the intermediate class. Okay. They have two. They have two beginners, two intermediates, and an advanced class each year, and it's four hundred seventy-five dollars for three days. It's on my bucket list, um, but it's thirteen hundred miles away. But she won't let you in unless you've done these. On uh, the intermediate class. So the first thing you do, as any woodworker does, is they go buy the equipment before they even try doing what they do. Well, we've got equipment here, but I don't do that. So equipment, next. So I already had a scroll saw, okay? It's an Excalibur um, EX21. But what I didn't have on it was a, a big light and a magnifier. Everything that Judy Gale Roberts does on an inside line where there's two pieces of wood matching, she does that with a magnifier. I found that I cannot use a magnifier. It shows two lines. 
whether I use one eye, two eyes, whatever. I have astigmatism, uh, and I try to number different magnifiers. So just if you're doing it, just be careful by your tester before you do it.